Oh, I'm really excited because we talked to these people before they went up. Now they're down. We're talking about the Hawaii Space Exploration Analog and Simulation, or High Seas. High Seas. If you want to figure out what it's going to be like to live on Mars, you need to practice. That's right. You need to try it. You need to see experiment. So joining us right now, one of the people who just spent a year, uh, 8,200 feet high on the slopes of Mauna Loa, in a 12,000-foot space capsule. Six people for one year. Uh, Anjay Stewart, he's the chief engineering officer, the Scotty of the team. Hi, Anjay. Hi there, and I just want to give a quick correction there. It's actually 1,200 square feet, so wow. uh, 12,000 would be uh, rather luxurious. <laughs> 1,200? You can't, that's 200 per person. So, wow, and is this what we expect a Mars habitat might be like? Certainly. I mean, in um, any space engineering, the more mass you send, the more fuel it takes to get there. You have to have enough that you can live and have enough room to work, but you want to minimize as well. So it's uh, it was actually quite spacious. I mean, the dome shape makes it a very... Uh, very sort of open feeling inside. I mean, uh, in the main area, we had a two-story high roof just because of the uh, dome shape. Oh, nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at it. I mean, it looks like you're on Mars. Did you do uh, walks? I guess you don't call them EVAs, but did you, did you leave the dome? And we actually did call them EVAs just to sort of keep things as realistic as possible. Um, if you notice there, we have a crew member in one of our simulated spacesuits. So we did go outside and indeed had to go outside. Part of the reason you would send a crew to Mars is to study the geology around the uh, habitat. And so we simulated tasks like that. Um, a couple of our uh, researchers also had some experiments that they were running outside as well. And of course, um, like any complicated system, things broke sometimes, and some of the equipment was outside the habitat, so we'd have to go out in our spacesuits and fix those things. Now, when I think of, I'm glad we're showing these pictures here, because when I first, when I was thinking of Hawaii, doing this in Hawaii, I was thinking, oh, yeah, we <laughs> oh, had to do... Oh, how luxurious. Yeah, we had to do these EVA walks, and we went down to the beach, <laughs> yeah. and, you know, we had some shaved ice. Mount Aloha looks like <laughs> Mars, doesn't it? It does. It actually does, though. I mean, this really looks... Is that why they chose this? Did they choose this specifically? Uh, because it really did pattern kind of the geography that might be on Mars? That was a major consideration for sure. Um, a, a contributing factor as well is this is a project run by the University of Hawaii. So, you know, keeping it local, of course. But yes, as you saw up there, it's very barren, very isolated. It's close enough to civilization that the researchers can access it when they need to, but far enough away that for a whole year, we didn't have anybody messing with us up there. We literally were on our own. Wow, look at that. I mean, it really does look like shots from the movie. Yeah. Yeah, uh, The Martian. The Martian. Yeah. Really incredible. Did you grow potatoes for food? <laughs> um, I didn't. We did have a crew member attempt to grow potatoes. Unfortunately, those actually failed. I think it was uh, due to um, some drainage issues they had with the uh, setup there. So but we had what? Lot go oh, ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Oh, okay, sure. Um, we did have a lot of other fresh foods, though. Um, some of our crew members were growing things like chard, kale, wow. lettuce, that sort of thing. Um, these were very rare. So whenever we did have um, a small bowl That's of special. Uh, fresh food on the table, yeah, yeah. exactly. It was a very big morale boost. For What's the, the first meal you had when you got out? Um, we actually had some breakfast set up for us whenever we came out, and I'd been asking for some good Hawaiian pineapples. So nice. Yeah, best pineapple in the world. I didn't want to pass that up. Nice. And fresh is good, right? Fresh, fresh is food. always good. Yeah. Yeah. Did you lose a lot of weight during the time period? I did, but it was on purpose. Um, the nice thing about not having restaurants is around is you're, and having to cook your own food is you're having a good home-cooked meal every day. It's probably very um, healthy, yeah. It was very healthy. We were... Um, exercising on a daily basis. So I started the mission at 195. I'm down to about 180 right now. I'm probably in some of the best shape of my life. What's your, what's your training, your scientific training? What's your background? Um, my background's in aerospace engineering. So okay. before this mission, I was a flight controller for interplanetary missions at Lockheed Martin in Denver. Oh, so flying a bunch of the Mars rover, sorry, Mars spacecraft. Um, <laughs> the Juno mission that just arrived at Jupiter a couple of months back, I had some work on that. And my main project was as a point and control engineer on the Spitzer Space Telescope. Oh, cool. That's really cool. And your uh, team members, your five teammates, they all were scientists of some kind? Um, for the most part, yes. I mean... Sort of a wide spread of sciences, though. Our commander, for instance, was a soil scientist. Um, Shea was a uh, doctor and a journalist, so it was nice having oh, a journalist neat. on the crew as well to sort of document things as yeah. we went on. But just sort of a wide variety of skills on the team, which helps whenever you have such a varied amount of tasks while you're up there. Well, and similar to an actual uh, away right. team, would 
away team. I feel like I'm talking about Star Trek. <laughs> <laughs> But it is. You're no, kind of the. Like and I noticed you're wearing a red shirt. I'm not going to say anything. It's actually burnt orange. Uh, okay, okay, that's safe. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, actually, <laughs> hook them mean, horns. Oh, and as soon as as soon as the horns came out, the Skype. Is that a? Uh, yeah. It's the red shirt. Okay, I apologize for that. My computer. Yeah. Part uh, of uh, I guess mission operations is uh, adjusting to things as they happen. I'll exactly. start. Exactly. Yeah. I like the hook them horns thing. Are right. you are you a University of Texas uh, alumnus? I'm guessing. Uh, yes, sir. Um, graduated in 2005 with my uh, undergraduate. Do you want to go to Mars? Um, absolutely. I would love the chance. That was part of my reason on, for coming on the mission, actually, was uh, wanting to um, understand what it's like to be an astronaut. Um, whenever you watch astronauts on TV, they're doing very fun, very cool things. They're riding on rockets. They're wearing spacesuits and things like that. And that's the fun stuff, but the hard part is you are separated from family. You're separated from friends and things like that. And so um, I wanted to understand the whole job. And after this, I can still say I would be very happy to go to Mars. So we just had something go wrong, you know, just here, right? What kind of things <laughs> went wrong actually while you were in the dome? I mean, I noticed, you know, obviously you guys are off the grid, you've got solar panels, you know, you're trying to emulate things as, as much as possible. Like, did you have any emergencies or was there any a moment where we had, like, look guys, we gotta go call for help or something? Oh, certainly. Um, and it actually helped to hammer home just how um, dependent on the systems the uh, real astronauts will be. Um, Sorry, just starting Skype back up on the computer here. I'm going off my phone right now. Oh, um, wow. See, there yeah, you there, go. This is an example. That's it. He's a Here's tech. You yeah, you just got to work with it. You know, you just got to work <laughs> with it. That's awesome. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, it's, um, we had network issues, so we would lose our communications with the ground, sometimes because of reasons that were out of our control. Um, one time, one of our communications relays on the uh, mountain on the other, opposite side of the island got hit by lightning, and we were wow. uh, out of hmm for several hours. Um, probably the most dramatic one would be the, a, a problem we ran into about a month and a half before the end of the mission. Um, we lost our uh, main uh, water supply. Oh. Uh, system stopped working. We stopped getting pressure to the water. So um, we had to go out to the tanks with buckets and pull water out sort of one bucket at a time in our spacesuits. And then eventually we were able to troubleshoot the system, found out it was a problematic filter that was um, preventing water from coming through. And eventually we got water back. But in the meantime, we were, um, you know, couldn't shower for a couple of weeks. We were doing everything we could to minimize water. And this is awesome, though, because yeah. that's exactly the kind of thing that would happen. Right. And it's really, uh, now, I, I, you said the University of Hawaii is doing this. Is NASA participating? Are they interested? What's their relationship to this? So the University of Hawaii are sort of in charge of running the uh, sort of day-to-day -day operations of the, the project itself. NASA provides funding, and they also provide a lot of the uh, research as well. Okay. So, um, so this is exactly part of the process of getting a manned mission to Mars that you would go through. Absolutely. This is... Um, Something NASA is very interested in right now. Yeah. We can design better spacecraft, um, but we can't design a better human being. And so, especially from a mental and um, a, a team coherence point of view. So this is something NASA wants to know about. They want to make sure that crews can survive nine months in deep space and then however long they stay on Mars and then another nine month cruise back and be able to work together, um, deal with problems and be able to be an effective and operational crew the whole time. So you were there one year exactly? Yes, sir. The longest Actually, mission um, yet. Um, it was a leap year, so we were there for an extra day too. So 366, <laughs> we took advantage. And by the way, he's not gonna let you forget that. <laughs> no, no, and, no. and I'm guessing your wife isn't either. You're married. Yes, sir. How did your wife react when you say, um, honey, I'm thinking I'm going up on a mountain for a year? Um, I'm very lucky to have a wife who also works in space flight. I would oh, uh, love to be an astronaut as well and was very understanding as to why I'd want to do something like She's this. She's next. She's next. And by the way, they're still looking. They're good. You've got two more missions at least, right? Eight-month missions this time. Correct. And they'll be shifting their focus um, a little bit to looking more. Now that we sort of know some of the effects that go on, how do we s select a crew that can deal with those. So they'll be working on sort of optimizing how they select crews for these missions. Were there psychological issues? What were the challenges? 
Well, it's um, if you've ever had a college roommate, it's sort of the same thing taken to an extreme. You know, it's uh, people have different points of view, uh, come from different cultures and backgrounds. So um, sooner or later, you're going to run into a disagreement. And unlike in the real world, where if somebody really gets on your nerves, you can leave the room or you can go find something somewhere else to blow off steam. When you're stuck in a dome, you can't. You have to find uh, constructive ways to deal with those situations. So it's um, you had to work through things. And again, that's part of the research as well. The um, the researchers would like to sort of understand if there's perhaps some way to measure how the astronauts' moods are and if there's a way they can sort of step in and suggest perhaps exercises to help crew get through things before things become a bigger problem. So we talked a little bit about things that went wrong mechanically, but I always love to ask engineers this question whenever I talk to them is, what did you not, what did you learn that you didn't expect to learn? Is there anything that came out of this where you, I, I had no idea that I would be, that we would find this thing out of, through this process? Um, Again, it was very interesting uh, just listening to the researchers afterwards for, you know, reasons of simulation fidelity and things like that. They can't tell us exactly what they're looking for oh, during the uh, yeah. experiment. But I guess for me, rather than from the NASA perspective, just sort of an overall perspective, it was very interesting to be sort of in this world where you're focused on the best of humanity. Yeah, um, we didn't um, – we heard about some major events, the attacks in France, the attacks oh, in Orlando. And, and you, have, like that. you had a French crew member, right? Yes, sir, and that affected him very greatly. Oh, but um, apart from that, we didn't, you know, if you watch the news, there's sort of a big long stream or on social media as well, you know, we're at war with this country or, you know, this murder happened today. And we're somewhat sheltered from that. So you didn't you have know? TV feeds. You had uh, limited radio feeds, the kinds, um, frankly, you'd have on Mars, very limited communication. Exactly. Um, and one thing we had uh, set up with our mission support team was to have them send a uh, science uh, news or fact of the day every day. Oh, neat. And um, it's different just sort of being in this environment where you're focused on the best of mankind. Yeah, you know, what yeah. did we learn today that we didn't know yesterday? What a good idea. Um, and so it's just interesting to come back to that. Yeah, and now see, you're back in the real world and it's all crap. Right. I well, would do this. Crap, I would do this just to get away from Twitter for right. a year. It would be awesome. <laughs> well, it's um, you know, it's uh, it gives you sort of the perspective that as a species, all this bad stuff is going on, but there's a lot of good stuff going yeah. on too, and yeah. it sort of gives you sort of the drive to focus on that good stuff That's and great. to pass on that enthusiasm and get everybody else sort of looking at the world that way as well. Love it. If you'd like to apply, you have a couple more days. They're actually accepting applications through September 5th. There are two more missions, and there's an application form on the website, on the High Seas website. Um, boy, that'd be cool. Would you do this again if, if you were offered it, Andre? Or are you going to save it for Mars now? Um, it depends. Of course, you know, I'm sure um, my wife, Christy, definitely would like me to be, you know, more on the ground for a little bit before I do something like this again. But, you know, depending on what came along where I was in sort of my personal life, um, perhaps another simulated mission, probably not this long, just yeah. because, you know, That's again, I've got time. the family commitments. Yeah. Uh, and of course, if NASA came along and told me I could be a real astronaut, hey, you can send me anywhere you want. <sighs> me too. Me too. I just want to say... Any, I mean, who wouldn't? Wouldn't right. you do oh, that? Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, I would go to Mars. Oh, I, Mars. Is even if they said you can't come back, like this is because there's one possibility is it's a one-way trip and you're going to be a colonist, right. not a not an astronaut. Um, I would do it, and I'm old, so I don't mind. Right? I'm just telling you that, <laughs> so I don't mind. Uh, I, this is uh, this is so cool. I'm so glad, and I know we're keeping you from your flight home and a reunion with your wife. <laughs> I know you cannot wait, and I'm sure Christy can't wait either. So I just want to, we'll let you go. I just want to thank you so much, Anjay, for visiting with us and for doing this. And I am so excited about the notion of, of people going to Mars. And I really hope this, this becomes a reality. I love seeing us take steps towards it. Right? Yeah. It's a lot of fun. Absolutely. Eight, eight. And, and for me, that's sort of focusing on, you know, pushing us further and further. There's sort of this great unknown and lots of stuff out there for us to explore. And I'm personally excited to be uh, contributing to the science that will help us get out there. Your timing is perfect. Uh, you're you came back on the uh, 
50th anniversary of Star Trek. Uh, there you debut go. Debut on TV right. in 1966. <laughs> uh, H-I-C-E-A-S dot org if you want to know more or apply. Why not? You know, maybe, maybe you get to spend some time on the mountain. Thank you so much, Anjay. Have a great trip home. Will do, and thank you for having me on the show today. I Isn't appreciate that cool? it. Yeah. That Thanks. So, so cool. Thank you. That's awesome. <sighs> That's so cool. I'm just putting myself into that whole experience now as we're talking. I'm like, ah, oh, what would you do? You know, close quarters. I got to go to the bathroom. You're like, all of these little things that you don't think about until you think about, oh no, we're actually going to be living yeah. in a 1,200 square foot with five other space. people. Yeah. And I got to make it work. That's. I think fancy. my dorm room must have been, you know, at least half that big, and I only had one roommate. So <laughs> I don't know how they do that with six people. We talked to them. Who did we talk to, Jerry? Uh, a year ago on this show, we talked to somebody before they went on. Wow. Two other crew members. Uh, so you can go back to the early, a uh, year ago, uh, screensavers and see them before they went in. Before they went in. Mm. And now Anjay, after, uh, after the year is up. Very exciting.